for this lovely introduction and the invitation. Uh, so my name is Hannah Pilgrim. I'm working here in Berlin for the NGO PowerShift. We are dealing with issue trade issues and some of my colleagues are here as well. Um, and we are also um, facing the raw materials transition or we're dealing with these topics. Um, and yeah, I'm quite glad to be here. And maybe Fini, you could introduce yourself and then we will give you more information about the upcoming minutes. Mm -hmm. Hello to everybody. My name is Josefine Koch. I'm working as well as Nelly for the Forum on Environment and Development, uh, basically um, to uh, raw materials policy, uh, resource policies in, in general, and transparency on raw materials. And um, yeah, a lot with Hannah together in different networks. Yeah, nice to be here. Thank you. Okay, great. I'm going to uh, share the slides now so that you can follow us. So is it in a proper way now? Perfect. So uh, before we start now to dive a little bit deeper into the topic of raw material and trade, um, I want to give you an overview um, about the upcoming hour. Uh, so first of all, we like to introduce, introduce us in a more proper way. So who are we and what we are doing? Uh, because we are, as Fina already said, we are connected in a working group called Raw Materials. And then Fina is going to have a focus on the main pillars of a raw materials transition. This is our vision um, as we discuss it in civil, civil society. And then we decided that we focus on a very current uh, European process um, to tackle the topics uh, and questions which were raised in the teaser of this webinar. So we are going to focus on the Critical Raw Materials Act um, because we, we thought it illustrates, illustrates quite good the problems and also the dimensions of our work and we want to yeah shed light on this topic and uh, show you why it's quite important to focus on that in the upcoming year or years maybe. Um, so this will be the main issue. We are focusing on it. We prepared a table. So because of course the, the proposal for this act is, I don't know, 70 to 90 pages long. So we try to focus on different topics and also want to give you first analysis or evaluation of it. Um, and then we hopefully have a little bit of time as well to discuss Pass it afterwards. So this is, um, yeah, this is our plan for the upcoming minutes. Um, so I would like to, sh uh, to first of all, um, um, tell something about who we are. So Fina and me, um, we are organized in a civil society network called um, raw, Working Group Raw Materials in Germany, AK Rohstoffe. Um, I'm the coordinator and uh, Fina is for a long time now a part of the steering group. Um, and we are a joint group of organizations in the field of human rights, environmental protection, uh, also climate work and global solid solidarity. Um, and um, yeah, but uh, Fina is going to focus on that, why we are working on these topics as well. Um, yeah, and we have a special focus on metals, on metal supply chains, and uh, we will dive into this uh, a little bit deeper. We are um, existing for almost 10 years now, um, and I think as reality shows us so far, uh, our jobs are, yeah, we have a lot to do uh, also in the upcoming years. Um, just very briefly, what are we doing? Um, you can imagine, so we write statements uh, and position papers together on relevant raw materials issues. Our main target is the national political sphere, but uh, we are also focusing on European level. Um, and we are also organizing uh, joint activities. Uh, for example, we have the format of the Alternative Raw Materials Week and also last autumn, we called out the Raw Materials Summit, for example, to shed light on the environmental and human rights issues along the supply chain. But um, yeah, I, I leave it here. And now I give the word uh, to Fina to tell us why we are actually focusing on metals. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, as you can see, Germany, or as you probably know, Germany is a country of raw materials imports. Uh, basically, um, so we are speaking now from a, our German perspective, more or less. Um, Germany is one of the biggest 
consumers worldwide, I think one of the fifth biggest um, um, internationally, and in the same time, 100% uh, uh, percent deep uh, dependent on uh, metals. That's why we, we focus on, on metals uh, in our work. Um, yeah, and we have a, a German raw, raw material strategy uh, from, from the government since 2010 it is uh, into effect and it's focused on raw material security basically uh, due to uh, much import we have and as you probably know Germany is an automotive land so the car sector is the most um, important branch um, we are also an important industrial location but uh, we have very little uh, domestic mining um, apart from coal and a little bit gas and uh, stones and earth. Uh, so the very current raw material policy of the government is first, and this is uh, quite new, uh, extend to the domestic mining um, to the, the diversification of commodity uh, trading and uh, third to strengthen um, the uh, circular economy. So what are our main pillars of uh, the transition of raw materials? Um, we want to create a um, counter narrative to the hegemonic raw material security supply. So our vision is um, a, a raw material transition. Uh, and this is about the absolute reduction of raw materials. It means in, in data, um, we demand a six tons per year cap in capita for abiotic raw materials and two tons um, for biotic raw materials until uh, 2030 in Germany. And we think we need similar binding um, targets for the EU and binding measures um, as well. Yeah, second, we, we say we need a real circular economy. What means a real circular economy? A circular economy that is not only focused on a little bit more recycling and technology for more efficiency. Um, yeah, and we have, as you might know, uh, a national secure, uh, circular economy tra uh, strategy planned for this year in Germany as well. Um, and we also need a legal framework on corporate due diligence uh, on EU level with highest human rights and environmental standards and the whole supply chain is also uh, another demand uh, um, and also global fair trade policy and the protection and strengthening of rights of those who are affected, um, especially indigenous peoples. Okay, great. Thank you, Fina. So um, after we hear our vision of the raw materials transition, we like to focus now or um, yeah, to focus on the Critical Raw Materials Act, uh, which was or actually the proposal of the Critical Raw Materials Act was launched or released uh, last Thursday. So it's very new. Maybe you already had the time to also have the look inside so we can exchange our first analysis in the end. Um, so I, I would like, wait, is it working? Yeah, I would like, uh, first of all, uh, to focus on the question, what is it, uh, this Critical Raw Materials Act, and uh, why it is important? And then we um, yeah, will show you a little bit on the, on the main topics and uh, with our table we prepared and we can, we hope it is helpful for you as well. So what is it actually? Um, after the experiences uh, with the pandemic um, and also the war in Ukraine, uh, the dependencies on other countries in terms of metals, minerals, but also fossil fuels uh, became even clearer. And this proposal for regulation is a set of actions uh, to ensure the EU's access to a secure, diversified, how they say, and uh, and sustainable supply chain of critical raw materials. But then the question is, what is 
what are critical raw materials. Um, they are defined uh, as raw materials which are of high strategic importance for the enhancement of the so-called green transition. So for example, for electromobility, renewables, uh, digital technology, but also defense. Um, and at the same time, they face a very high risk of supply disruptions. So, for example, and most of the critical raw materials are metals. Um, so, for example, the group of the rare earth elements or cobalt, nickel, manganese or lithium. Um, but this proposal does not come out of the blue. Um, the Commission released already in 2008 uh, the Raw Materials Initiative and renewed, I think, in 2011 to ensure the supply security in Europe, like in Germany, like Fina already mentioned, and launched also in 2020 the EU Critical Raw Materials Action Plan. And this was actually the beginning of the whole process. And last autumn, maybe you, re uh, you remember that Ursula von der Leyen mentioned uh, this planned act for the first time in her State of, U of, State of the Union's speech um, uh, when she said uh, lithium and rare earth elements um, will be more important than oil and gas in the future. So in short, this act intends to promote the mining, but also the refining and uh, recycling of um, the critical raw materials. But we are going to tell you a little bit more on that later. So mainly the proposed law is a direct reaction, you can say, to make the EU more independent of China uh, and prevent it from falling behind in the competition with China and the US. So why is it important? Uh, yeah, it set rules, standards, and also the narrative of uh, for whole Europe and also environmental and social standards uh, for Germany's and Europe's extractivism policies um, in the rest of the world. So it also has implications um, all over the world, this proposal or soon this uh, critical raw materials act. So um, let's dive a little bit deeper into this uh, proposal, Fino. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Hannah. Uh, we have prepared a um, table to, to show you on the left side the goals, the measures, the characteristics of the uh, Critical Raw Materials Act that is uh, launched recently, and on the right side, um, the problematic or at least noticeable uh, aspects we, we see. So, um, yeah. Uh, the first one on the left side, uh, the um, problem, um, the perspective of the uh, commission, I think, was that individual countries like, uh, above all, China, as Hannah already mentioned, uh, but also Turkey, Congo, uh, are actually having a monopoly of providing many critical raw materials. And um, yeah. So the, the um, act wants to extend domestic mining um, in the use of green transition. And um, from our point of view, this is a big paradigm shift in terms of the mining industry. Uh, the act sets a lot of measures. Um, raw material um, deposits of the EU itself could cover um, as as, as long as we know, uh, 20 to 40 percent for maximum of the demand in the next years, I, according to the Commission, was this, and the rest uh, must obtain by third countries. But yeah, this focus on domestic mining is um, is a paradigm shift in terms of the mining industries. Yeah, the uh, next point is um, the. Um, Supply focus targets um, on domestic mining, processing, and um, recycling. Uh, but the problem is um, there are no concrete targets to uh, limit demand and consumption. They are uh, totally missing. And so the overall problem of overconsumption of primary raw materials are not addressed at all. Yeah, uh, then um, the Critical Raw Materials Act make a distinction between um, critical raw materials. Uh, I think it's, yeah, 35 in total, um, and strategic raw materials. Uh, the first one is like 18 uh, raw materials and the second uh, 16. Uh, so the, foc uh, the focus in the EU on strategic is on strategic raw materials, which is characterized by 
high strategic importance for the so-called uh, green transition. And it is characterized also by um, the project global supply demand. Yeah, but the thing is, um, the demand cannot be considered to be set in stone. So criticality depends on how we assess and uh, steer the demand. Yeah, uh, another point is um, um, raw material projects are marked as strategic um, and they should contribute to security of supply and therefore labeled as public interest, which is uh, very interesting. So uh, strategic projects um, uh, become a status of high national importance. Um, which means um, a very weak involvement of um, affected communities. Um, environmental impact assessments are not mandatory, and there are actually no red lines, um, yeah, for no go zones, for instance, um, in, in the act. So ecological zones for, for the green transition can be sacrificed. Hania, can you go? Um, yes, thank you, Fina. So the strategic projects are really the core of this Critical Raw Materials Act. And now the question is, um, who's actually deciding why this is not working? Sometimes, yeah, now. Um, so who's deciding? Um, and the proposal provides uh, a new deciding institution. And this is the so-called uh, European Critical Raw Materials Board. Um, so they are assessing applications for strategic projects, and it is composed of um, representative uh, per, EU, per EU member states and also a representative of the Commission. And at the same time, they also plan to implement a so-called critical raw materials club. Um, which wants to bring together consuming and also resource-rich countries to promote um, the secure and sustainable supply of critical raw materials. But quite important is this new board and um, yeah, especially um, this board as a deciding institution holds a lot of power. Um, and it's also concerning to see that no specific mention of civil society um, yeah, that there's no specific mention of civil society. They only mention it in a way that when appropriate civil society or um, other experts can be invited. Um, also, the European Parliament is only invited as participants uh, in subgroups. There are, I think, four subgroups in this board or as observers. Um, so all in all, it's very concerning that civil society and also local population are not specifically mentioned um, in consultation or decision making processes. And furthermore, due to the absence of international standards like um, ELO 169, uh, it is even more concerning. Um, so maybe, yeah, we, we are quite concerned when it comes to this board. Um, so to the next point, uh, furthermore, this proposal uh, states that the permits granting process um, has to speed up. Uh, we don't have time. We realize we are quite dependent, so we really have to speed up the process. That means, uh, for example, that the approval of a strategic project, which includes extraction, will be shortened from um, the current 10 to 15 years to 12 to 24 months, um, primarily through faster environment, environmental assessment, for example. So this, yeah, as you might imagine, it's really a danger of watering down important environmental and social legislation, both within the EU, but also outside the EU, because strategic projects are not only uh, can only not only be implemented in the EU, but also in third countries. Um, and yeah, of course, in general, um, speeding up permits is not per se critical, uh, especially when its um, administrative, administrative functions are improved. But you also have to say when projects get fast tracked, uh, the time to ob obtain, for example, the community consent gets cut significantly as well. 
Um, so now to the targets. Uh, Fina already mentioned it, the uh, domestic extraction. Um, one of the main targets is that uh, the EU should provide the extraction of at least 10% of the EU's annual consumption of critical raw materials uh, by 2030. Um, today, the current uh, share is just 3%. Um, so, like in other countries, many raw material deposits are located in or near Natura 2000 protected areas, but also close to the territory of indigenous people. We see it in Sweden, for example, in the moment. Um, so, this is also quite concerning um, and, yeah, we have to focus on that. Um, another target is uh, that uh, by 2030, the EU should provide the processing uh, of at least 40% of the EU's annual consumption. Um, so currently there are almost uh, no referees in which the raw materials are further processed and refined. Uh, Thierry Breton mentioned that right now it's from zero to 20%. Uh, uh, so maybe you have more information on that, but this is a big change and it's still to be discussed um, whether this is a contradiction to strengthen the value adding intention in third countries. And this brings me to the next point. Actually, the proposal intends to support resource rich countries in building up local value creation and critical raw materials in the future. But so far, what we can see is that there is a lack of concrete implementation uh, instruments um, to, yeah, to support it really. <laughs> um, and the question is, if the if this goal of the 40% 40, uh, 40 of process, processing in the EU is also in conflict with this target. Um, yeah, and then we are coming to the point which is also uh, uh, in terms of trade issues quite interesting and I'm quite curious what you are saying. Um, the proposal as well as the communication of uh, this act are mentioning the so-called win-win partnerships. So it's not only strategic partnerships, but really win-win partnerships. Um, that means that strategic projects can be impl implemented, like I said, within the EU, but also in third countries. Um, so besides the enhancement of domestic mining, uh, the EU also wants to reinforce international engagement by developing these win-win um, partnerships. So they want to cooperate and trade more closely on uh, eye level with countries, for example, in Africa and South America. Um, and and also investing in the construction of refineries there. Um, also, the global gateway strategy is mentioned several times. Explicitly named countries are um, some in Latin America, Indonesia, South Africa, and strategic partnerships that have already been decided are with Canada, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and also Namibia. Um, so far, we see that there's an absence absence of um, strong language on due diligence um, and also a dependence on voluntary industry standards, um, which allows industry also on self-regulation. So I think uh, this might be very important to, um, to shed light on this issue and to discuss it even more. So Fina, please. Yeah. Yeah, the proposal um, also try to mitigate on uh, supply risk. Um, by 2030, the EU should not be dependent on any third country uh, for more than 65% of the EU's um, annual consumption of any raw material. Um, so yeah, this is another um, goal. But in fact, this means um, stabilizing the dependency. Um, most of the raw materials will continue to come from um, third uh, countries. Um, and the diversification of purchasing options doesn't mean uh, necessarily raw material security because uh, the use demand is too high. And if the com uh, consumption level of raw materials stay the same, um, and uh, yeah, and if they doesn't reduce. Uh, another point is um, it seems positive. The regulation complements corporate uh, sustainability uh, due diligence, uh, the due diligence uh, directive, um, but there is an absence of uh, strong 
due uh, diligence due um, the terminology, um, the corporate sustainability due diligence directive does not cover small and uh, medium enterprises. So it should uh, apply to all strategic um, projects, whether uh, large or, or small uh, or medium enterprises uh, in our, from our point of view. Uh, another uh, topic uh, tackles the uh, circular economy. Um, by 2030, the EU should provide the recycling for at least 15% of the EU's annual consumption um, of uh, critical raw materials. Um, we, um, yeah, this is what the proposal says, but this is uh, from our point of view, not ambitious um, at all. Um, requirements for the member states uh, are only to strengthen the collection and the recycling and do not um, have certain um, and specific targets, uh, only concrete in um, relation to permanent magnets, but not more. So what we need um, are EU-wide binding recycling and recyclate usage quotas um, and measures to reduce raw materials demands um, in, in general. So this is our... Uh, yeah, overview and first evaluation of um, the proposal from um, from the EU. Um, yeah, now we, we want to come um, to our uh, conclusions. Is it a new wine in green bottles? That is our question. We think, um, yeah, the proposal says clear uh, mining first, uh, speeding up permission permitting processes for more domestic extraction and processing for recycling can help keep Europe uh, competitive and uh, provide jobs, but this uh, comes at the cost of weakening environmental and social standards. Um, and also a strategic project risk sacrificing ecological zones for the green transition um, this is uh, what, what we fear. Uh, and even if the highest environmental and social standards are established, domestic mining is actually of uh, no use if we don't reduce our mat uh, raw material consumption. And uh, the Critical Raw Materials Act means, um, in fact, uh, a boostering instead of reducing of mining. And uh, yeah, it's a new colonial um, growth paradigm and it's fostering further industrialization. So um, strategies for a social, ecological and just transition are actually missing. And uh, from our point of view, it states also a Europe first. Uh, the Critical Raw Materials Act is in fact um, a revival of a geopolitical block building um, and where sustainability uh, plays a role, Berlin and Brussels are not thinking beyond the European horizon. Um, so what can we do? Um, yeah, at least uh, lobbying our politicians. Uh, and we have uh, recently released a, a manifest called Transition by Design, not uh, by Disaster that appear to uh, reduce raw uh, materials consumption in, in Germany. And we have uh, some talks with politi uh, politicians. Uh, and we hope, <laughs> um, yeah, at least we can talk about it. And um, yeah, and work on, on cre concrete concepts on alternatives um, and reduction plans, but uh, always uh, in close exchange with civil society, especially in the global south. So yeah, these are um, our first um, conclusions. Uh, we are interested in uh, knowing what, what you are thinking about it. And uh, I don't know if you have um, already think about the, the uh, Critical Raw Materials Act. And yeah, we have prepared some um, discussion points, but Maybe there are some questions um, raising already. Something to check. I think or Michael already answered ah, it. Yeah. 
uh, yeah, but this it's a good point um, to say that the so-called strategic projects, they are not only um, yeah, on extractives, but also uh, on refining and um, recycling. This could be also, so it um, includes the whole supply chain. I think this was the only question, or Nelly? Yeah, and maybe Nelly, you want to um, contribute from your side a little bit on uh, trade politics. Yeah, first of all, thank, thank you so much for this very interesting input. Um, I think also the up to date first insights into the critical raw materials X are, are very useful for us. Um, I now have the glorious um, task to kind of sum up four uh, lunch and learn sessions into a little uh, little structure so then we can enter the Q&A session and um, close on time so we all have a short and enriching lunch break. Um, so basically I thought I'll make this um, quick by summarizing under kind of four pillars that you can maybe take home. This is not a comprehensive summary, obviously, of, uh, of, of all four hours of, of input. But I think, and uh, with the Critical Raw Material Act and all you said, Josefina and Hannah, it's, it's, it's very helpful for us to, because we're at the beginning of interlinking these two very big, big spheres, the raw material uh, policy and trade policy. And if we look at uh, the object, the real objectives of the EU trade policy, and like look behind the curtain and look, okay, how is the is is our need and our demand and the Critical Raw Material Act for raw materials introduced or um, translated into EU trade policies? Um, maybe this is helpful. So the first one is basically if we say look behind the curtain, is like don't fall into the trap. The first trap is is the narrative of diversification and I think you showed it uh, very clearly that more sources is no guarantee first of all of a paradigm shift it's quite the opposite and secondly of a true security of supply and the point in your trade policy is that this focuses only on security of supply none of it is takes any environmental or human rights concerns into account um, so the new raw material chapters that we saw in session two and three, and um, also in session one, we got an, a nice overview, like in the EU Chile agreement, or also in the in the other comprehensive trade agreements such as EU Mercosur, they continue on this path of deepening the existing patterns of exploitative trade relations. Um, so this means also the deepening of extraction of raw materials uh, means also more environmental damages and increase of the potential for human rights abuses, um, in particular faced by the populations that live in these industrialized areas. So, um, and the other point that for us in trade policy is always super important is the addition in the competition for key mineral resources around the world. It, create, it creates, with the help of trade policy, it creates enormous opportunities uh, for investors to use um, their private court system. It's a one-way street, it's very dangerous, and it's basically the ISDS, the Investor State Dispute Settlement, puts a price tag on any kind of policy change that countries may want to conduct looking at their raw material policy. So whether it's uh, shaping your own country's natural resources policy or it's a new environmental regulation, these corporate privileges um, in trade agreements are very powerful and dangerous. And our goal should be to debunk this flawed storytelling around security of supply, get rid of, rid of ISDS and start talking more about the raw material transition. And I think the example of the Critical Raw Material Act and like really showing point to point where it is not ambitious enough um, are very helpful in this, this, um, in this um, relationship. So second pillar that you, yeah, take it or leave at home, uh, can take home is the hierarchization. So in the first session, Lucia um, and me, we talked about the architecture in trade agreements and how this is promoted, uh, how this is built to promote liberalization. And even though we have now some trends in terms of greening or um, socializing um, European trade agreements, by adopting essential element clauses or the so-called trade and sustainability chapters, 
we still have to argue and see and show on a daily basis that these aren't sufficient. Um, and that as long as the overall objective of EU trade policy is the focus on liberalization and growth and the specifics of security of supply, um, same as you, Josefina, showed in the in the Critical Raw Material Acts, where the language of due, 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 due diligence, sorry, <clears throat> is there, but it's so weak. So you kind of happen to have a deja vu. Um, so also the current negotiations with raw material chapters in particular give the impression that um, the European Union is basically keeping countries, uh, resource rich countries in the global south um, reduced to the role of a raw material supplier and they're not like an, on an equal footing partner that is able to uh, design and change paradigms um, in terms of their own uh, country owned policy. Um, so the socio-ecological transformation cannot be implemented on all principles. I guess this is a preaching to the, to the choir here, but we have to continue pushing against this narrative and the global justice dimension has to be strengthened. So um, this basically means domestic economic development has to be the number one priority and not international trade com combined with foreign investor privileges. Um, Two points left very quickly, and um, I think we can discuss further on them. One of them is the analysis and possible consequences. Um, you also named it for the Raw Materials Act. There are no red lines, even if they are, they can be crossed and they can be compensated in order to pass an agreement. Same for the trade negotiations. We have studies ahead, we have studies during the negotiations, but really, um, no trade agreement has an expiration date. And I guess if we want to face the challenges of, of today's world, um, we have to revisit uh, these trade relations and the objective of these trade relations. Um, and there have to be red lines in terms of environment and social justice. Um, the last point is participation and transparency. Um, I guess this is what we're doing at the moment is also an exercise of uh, trying to participate, but we're kind of knocking outside of the door because most of this is happening inside. Uh, same for the EU trade policy. Um, even though with the massive outcry around the uh, trans um, Atlantic Trade Agreement, TTIP, um, the Commission kind of um, developed the narrative of more participatory, uh, more civil society engaging trade policy um, approach, which has not delivered. So still most of the negotiations are happening behind closed doors um, and mainly in the presence of corporations really. I mean, if you look at numbers that corporate Europe Observatory puts out there regularly, um, I found some nice ones from the kind of uh, short um, revival of the TTIP negotiation in 2018. I think it was like on the table for around six months and the commission had around 50 meetings, um, uh, 40 with uh, uh, corporate lobbyists and 10% of them with civil society and uh, academia and so on. So I kind of shows the, the this balances this has not been addressed and without real participation of civil society and without public debate and the provisions um, uh, of uh, information it cannot be a democratic and just trade policy. So because of all of this, and I'm extremely thankful that we um, made this, this Lunch and Learn series happen, it is extremely important to understand uh, reciprocally as well the impacts of EU trade policy and raw material policy and how they relate to one another in order um, to organize ourselves as civil society. Um, so I guess, uh, We'll cut this short and jump directly to the questions and uh, your feedback. 